So a common question that we get is, are there biocompatible 3D printing materials? And if so, how does biocompatibility work? To help answer this question, I have with me Steve Pollack. He's the science fellow at Carbon and previously spent 10 years at the Food and Drug Administration, where he was the director of the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories. Steve, it's great to have you with us. Thanks, John. Great to be here. So let's talk about biocompatible 3D printing materials. Tell us about how the FDA thinks about biocompatibility. So let me unpack that a little bit. So biocompatibility is a statement that says the material is not going to harm the body. And different materials can be used to different extents in different parts of the body. And that's how biocompatibility gets stratified in terms of risk and location. What are the kind of classes? Sometimes you see the class one, class two, class three medical device. The classes of devices are all about risk and what the potential harm to a patient is if the device didn't work the way it was supposed to. So you've got class one devices, which are very low risk. Think toothbrush and very simple diagnostic tests. Class two devices are a bit more risky, potential uh, for problems if they aren't made right. Um, so there it's going to be more complicated tests certain implantable devices, uh, powered devices, more complicated diagnostics. Class three devices are high risk, and um, one has to be much more careful about how one manufactures them, what materials are in them. Now, when you're looking at different materials, you often see something say, you know, it's classified as safe for skin contact for a certain amount of time or safe for mucous membrane contact. What are the classifications there that designers and engineers and product creators need to be aware of? And it, it's the same kind of risk scat category. The FDA looks at how long something is going to be in contact with the body and where in the body it's going to end up. So the categories are surface contact, so the surface of the skin or the surface of the mucosa. Mucosa is the oral cavity or other entryways into the body. Um, whether it's in the body and doing something as if it as for instance in a surgical procedure, but it's not something that stays behind. And then lastly, implant devices. So those are those three big categories. There's also a duration categorization. So something can be in the body for less than 24 hours. It can be in the body from a day to 30 days. That's sort of medium term uh, contact. And then anything beyond 30 days is considered permanent. And so there's a matrix of tests that are required depending on where you go in the body and for how long the device is going to stay in place. And those tests range uh, at the simplest, which for all devices is, is the material safe to cells? That's called cytotoxicity. Is the material irritating? Does it cause a rash? Uh, does it cause any kind of chemical toxicity immediately? Or does it actually create an allergic response and that's called sensitization. And those set of three tests are sort of the bottom most tests required for any medical device. And they get uh, categorized under the ISO standards of ISO 10993-5 and-10. Anything else besides just simply long-term contact with skin or short-term contact with mucosa generally requires other tests, tests for uh, safety and contact with the blood, tests to make sure that the material or the device doesn't cause, doesn't cause genotoxicity, which is related to cancer. Uh, tests for long-term toxicity, which looks at the potential impact of things coming out of the material that the body metabolizes and turns into toxins. So those are the sort of categories of how you do the tests and why and when you do the tests. You'll occasionally hear people define a, a material as a class one or class two material. And that's really a misnomer. It simply says someone has taken this material and made a class one or class two device with it, and the FDA cleared the device. Generally, the FDA doesn't, doesn't clear or approve materials. So among the materials that Carbon has developed in-house for our 3D printing process, digital light synthesis, mm -hmm. um, you see different ways that these materials can be used with respect to the body. Can you explain kind of the different standards there and what Carbon says these materials can be used for? So we've actually looked at all the materials that we've manufactured at Carbon, and we've done those first three tests, the cytotox irritation and sensitization. All of our materials pass those tests. Um, there's a proviso there 
Um, the EPU materials are fine for skin contact, but they're really not appropriate for mucosal contact. So other than the EPU family of materials, all of our materials are suitable for long-term skin contact or that short-term, less than 24 hours mucosal contact. We've taken MPU 100 further. We anticipated that material would be used primarily in medical device applications. And for that material, we've also done the required tests for contact with tissue, bone, or dentin. That means primarily in a surgical situation. So for surgical tools, for uh, devices that are used to make measurements during the surgery, those sorts of devices would use MPU 100, and MPU 100 has had that additional set of tests for short-term toxicity. Viewers who are interested in learning more about biocompatible materials and the process for developing biocompatible devices or devices that may require FDA certification can get in touch with Carbon to learn more about this. There's a lot of stuff to consider here. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks, John. And if you want to learn more about 3D printing, more of these quick answers from additive experts, subscribe to Ask an Additive Expert here on YouTube.